Welcome to this featured event at the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction, Building Back Better and Greener for Resilient Recovery from the Pandemic, co-organized by UNDP and UNDRR through our partnership in the International Recovery Platform. I'm Yuki Matsuoka, head of the UNDRR office in Japan. Through this featured event by IRP, we have the opportunity to learn from one another and to share the lessons from our speakers today with the European region and the rest of the world so that we can improve recovery planning, policies, decisions, and practice to build back better, not just from the COVID-19 pandemic, but also how we can recover better from all disasters. Today, we have four esteemed speakers, followed by a discussion with two discussants. This session has been pre-recorded, so we will not be able to take questions from the audience during the recording. However, we will take your questions and comments offline and respond to them as best we can. The inbox for the submitting your questions is contact at recoveryplatform.org. We will repeat it at the end of the session. First of all, I'd like to invite Mr. Ronald Jackson to give his opening remarks. He's the head of DRR and recovery for building resilience team of the UNDP. And he is currently the chair of the IRP steering committee. Mr. Jackson, please. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, should I say Yuki? Distinguished representatives, panelists, member of the IRP, participants. It's my great pleasure as co-chair of the IRP and uh, as a representative of UNDP and the partnership with UNDRR to welcome you, but also to provide brief opening remarks on this very important side event on building back better and green for resilient recovery from the pandemic. No doubt we've been living in challenging times. The climate challenges coupled with traditional hazards and threats have combined to threaten our aspirations for attaining the sustainable development goals. The pandemic has layered on top of that, resulting in cascading and compounding challenges for attaining a resilient future. But even challenges themselves provide opportunities, a chance to reflect, review, re-examine, reimagine, renew, and redouble our efforts towards attaining a sustainable pathway towards development. In that regard, the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic presents a once in a lifetime opportunity to embark on a resilient, sustainable and net zero development pathway. Prioritizing green measures in recovery offers a win-win option in addressing climate change, the environment or economies and society. A green recovery is a means to build back better by focusing on policies and solutions that put people and the planet first and reducing the risk of disasters in the long term. Analysis have shown that greening the recovery programs can create jobs and generate co benefits by enhancing environmental outcomes, boosting economic activity, and ensuring well being for all. Specifically, green measures can bring higher multiplier effects through private investments, economy wide decarbonization, pollution control low training jobs, sustainable ecosystems, and providing positive social impacts. There has been much discussion at the other disasters reduction regional forums and at COP26 on green recovery, nature-based solutions, and green financing. This shows that the world is paying attention and taking green recovery actions seriously. Similarly, here at the European Forum on DRR, green recovery is taking the center stage. As we already know, Europe is leading the way in green recovery spending. A recently published analysis indicated that green and resilient spending account for 30% of European stimulus packages during this crisis. Many countries and organizations in the region have committed to building back better with green priorities in sectors such as energy, transport, buildings, and nature capital. The International Recovery Platform is recognized in the Sendai framework as a mechanism for sharing experience and learning among countries and all relevant stakeholders in the area of recovery. This event, therefore, is a critical venue to support the IRP's mission and its essential role within the Sendai framework to share experiences, 
good practices, and lessons learned globally. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed panel of speakers and to the open dialogue on the key points they will share. Again, let me welcome you, bring you greetings on behalf of the IRP team, the UNDP team, and our colleagues at UNDIR. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. So now I'd like to give the microphone to my colleague, Mr. Paul Rosenberg from UNDRR and the IRP Secretariat to moderate the panel discussion. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Matsuka. As Ms. Matsuka has already mentioned, we have four esteemed speakers with us today, followed by a discussion with the speakers and two distinguished discussants. Our first speaker today uh, will be Ms. Rita Misal, who is a, the Recovery Advisor uh, for the Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery for Building Resilience team at UNDP. And she'll be speaking about the lessons learned for green and resilient recovery planning. Our second speaker, uh, Mr. Theodoros Zakariadis, is an Associate Professor uh, in Energy and Environment and Water Research uh, at the Cyprus Institute. He'll be speaking about a science policy framework to design a post-pandemic recovery aligned with the SDGs. Our third speaker today is Ms. Charo Bist, who is the resident representative uh, for UNDP in Azerbaijan. And she will be presenting the case of Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan's experience in prioritizing uh, green recovery uh, in its national COVID-19 recovery plan from the coronavirus recovery needs assessment process. For our fourth speaker, we're pleased to have Mr. Valeri Bezos, who is the head of uh, the State Agency on Energy Efficiency and Energy Saving for the government of Ukraine. And he will be uh, speaking about building back greener in the energy sector from COVID-19. And without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, Ms. Rita Misal, who will talk about coronavirus uh, recovery needs assessments and how we can apply this methodology to planning for building back better and, and greening recovery. Uh, Rita is the uh, Global Recovery Advisor for the United Nations Development Programs Crisis Bureau based in the New York office. Uh, she is a post-disaster recovery practitioner with over 20 years of experience in the field of disaster recovery. And she started her career in disaster management after the super cyclone in Odisha in 1999, and then uh, uh, in the Maldives after the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, earthquake and tsunami in 2004. And since 2007, Rita has been working in various positions in Geneva, Bangkok, and in New York. She leads the UN Partnership on Conducting Post-Disaster Recovery Needs Assessments. And in this capacity, she has led UNDP's global efforts in conducting COVID-19 recovery needs assessments. Ms. Misal, please go ahead and share your screen, unmute your microphone, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I'm very pleased to be joining here the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction uh, with uh, an invitation particularly from a colleague uh, from IRP. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, making space for us to speak about very, very pertinent issues about uh, green and resilient recovery planning. I'm also pleased uh, that this is an opportunity for us to share uh, our experiences at the UN system in this forum on COVID-19 recovery needs assessment and experience that we started picking on as soon as the pandemic started. And I'll speak about a little bit more. Uh, just to uh, go through some quick facts as of, of COVID-19, everybody is quite aware about that. As of November 18 today, we have a caseload of 253 million uh, cases and more than 5 million uh, fatalities due to COVID-19. And statistics from the World Bank and the International Labour Organization tells us that about 97 million people were pushed into poverty in 2020. Uh, and about 205 million people will go without jobs in 2022. So it shows the, the pandemic is not a health crisis. It shows that the pandemic is a social crisis. It's an economic crisis. But also more importantly, when we go to the greater social issues, uh, the UN Secretary General has declared that this, the gender-based violence that is seen, the rise in gender-based violence is seen is called like a shadow pandemic of a shadow pandemic because many, many women are being affected. 
the case loads in uh, gender based violence is increasing and uh, almost many women even if they are locked down at homes have no recourse uh, to to any sort of relief from uh, the violence they face every day almost then of course the status of women healthcare workers and also bringing to our attention that more women than men are losing their jobs forever an unpaid economy care economy has increased a lot so <clears throat> this is usually uh, in every in every uh, crisis we see this situation in the pandemic is even worse than before but here today we are here to focus on the environmental impact of the pandemic and uh, i would before i go into the crna methodology i would like to talk about the environmental impact there are three critical impacts that we have seen the first one is a huge generation of healthcare waste and plastic waste believe it or not what we began as you know an essential which is using of mask and gloves has become a big spike in hazardous waste because of the large usage of personal protective equipment not only by the medical fraternity by healthcare workers but by every general population and the disposal of that is a very careless method of disposal and additionally because we are all staying at home the use of plastic plastic packaging and plastic waste is tremendously or heightened or use of it has increased and then because of that there is this uh, congestion in drains congestion in um, in uh, waste systems that is leading to uh, blockages and in making life uh, very very difficult in urban cities continue to that also because of that i think the huge amount of waste generated and even the lockdown measures that have been created by the government the sanitation services have been disrupted in several several cities for many days together also waste pickers who normally the informal waste pickers who normally take care of all the waste that is not being able to dispose to the municipal waste system uh, are no longer being able to do so so you see a twin uh, challenge of decline in waste collection system the formal waste collection system but also a decline in waste pickers who would normally take use uh, sort out waste and sell them for their own economy and then of course the third point in environmental impact is the human interference with biodiversity initially when the pandemic happened there was this very high note in which everybody was very happy that you know carbon emissions have reduced uh, there is uh, fresh air water quality has improved but now they are realizing that suddenly that there is a lot of interference in uh, biodiversity converting land for food has become a big um, has become a problem now and also a large environmental degradation has led that the, a given an environment enabling environment for pathogens to leave leap from uh, animals to humans uh, but given all that also we have to realize that the pandemic and the economic crisis has underscored the importance of environmental health and resilience and it should become environmental health should become a critical component of public health so the important part of public health is uh, better air quality and that was something we saw in the short term in the pandemic after the pandemic but what we are talking here about is long term reduce reduction of carbon emissions and that is something that should be aimed to we are looking at improve water quality effective waste management biodiversity protection which will not only reduce the vulnerability of communities but also improve the well-being and quality of life and also a strong recognition of the interconnectedness of systems that the pandemic has a cascading impact of one sector of the other if power sector is affected then economy is affected if economy is affected then uh, lives and livelihoods are affected jobs are lost and if jobs are lost there is food insecurity and if there is food insecurity then health uh, of the people maternal mortality and child mortality increases morbidity increases so this interconnectedness of systems and the need for all systems to work together that recognition can only has only come from the pandemic you know it's no longer my department and my ministry but rather us working together to address the overall um, overall risk 
then there is a huge opportunity to use fiscal stimulus packages to address social and environmental um, impacts of the pandemic. So what is the scope we are talking about? Here we are talking about you know, various green sectors and activities to offer significant prospects for jobs through ecosystem restoration, renewable energy, organic farming, and reskilling of people for jobs. We're also talking about, in that sense, uh, giving jobs to people in the tourism sector, transforming them from being regular tourism to ecotourism. That would then enable to protect the ecosystem, but also provide opportunities for uh, livelihoods among people, new opportunities for livelihoods among people. We're talking also about investments in water and sanitation, water, water quality, good water quality, and access to water, access to water at the location where people are, particularly in an environment where people's movements are restricted is extremely important. And that, that is one of the major priorities where green recovery would be helpful if people have access to clean drinking water. And not only that, it would also take us towards the goal uh, of uh, fulfilling the goal of the sustainable development. We're talking here also about investment in digital con connectivity and e-commerce platforms. And then, of course, the most important thing that we have noted in the pandemic is the increase in food insecurity. And because our food is being imported or even raw, raw materials being imported, therefore food production has been affected. And so it's important that food production becomes more local nowadays rather than dependent on high supply chains from outside. So therefore, shorter supply chains and localized production is what can be done. And a new phenomenon that has been seen in developed economies, particularly that you would notice, and that is extremely good, is the decongestion of cities. We have seen pe people moving away from cities to going to rural spaces, which means there's a greater demand for energy efficiency and digital connectivity in rural areas. And you know, more people moving from cars to using electric scooters and more space actually for enhancing public activities where people have more leisure time and more um, uh, space for leisure activities. How have we done, uh, how have we address the issue of uh, build back better and green recovery in COVID-19 recovery needs assessment? Typically in an assessment, we have two pillars of our work. The first is what we do is a sectoral pillars where we work against seven or eight or 10 or 15 sectors as we did in Zambia. We are looking at key sectors of the economy, which would include agriculture, health, education, environment, energy, um, and uh, transport, employment, livelihoods, all other sectors of the economy that we look at. But, and we also, when we are doing a sector economic analysis, for us was this to look at is how are these sectors affected by the environment or what environmental measures can be taken to protect the sectors. For example, in the agriculture sector, how are we looking at how agriculture production has decreased or increased due to the pandemic, but also how it can be improved through organic farming, through sustainable organic practices, uh, sustainable practices of agriculture, so that you know the agricultural practices are locally grown, people um, train, train in using organic farming skills, but also make sure that we forests and other ecosystems are maintained. And then overall, our approach has been, let us look at a recovery strategy that will intertwine all these three elements. And the three elements are on the side. The three elements that every recovery strategy should have is they should have nature-based solution. It should speak to resilient systems. It should accelerate climate change agenda. These are the three point objectives for all our recovery strategies. In different ways, it has been highlighted, and I will share with you certain country examples of how this has been done. This, this is the South Africa, an example of the South Africa study. The government of South Africa, when we first started the COVID-19 recovery assessment, in fact, this was the first one we conducted globally among the 10 we conducted all over till now in the last one year. They have been extremely ambitious and said that their main goal in the short term is to preserve in the medium term is to recover, and in the long term to actually pivot around completely, change the strategy of the economic growth to make sure that it is uh, resilient, it is sustainable, and it is green. 
this was the ambition of the government of south africa so it was not very difficult for us to put that ambition into paper and the first thing in terms of preserving is to look at how do we look at address the needs of people who are insecure food insecure how do we take care of informal workers children and women and how do we need leave no one behind some of these aspects that we are looking also when we looked at the health crisis we looked at health waste management is the first time that we started looking at the case of health uh, workers were also waste pickers so when we are talking about resilient systems we were talking about social protection and social assistance expanding then to people who are not under coverage in no country informal workers are under coverage in very few countries waste pickers are under coverage so resilient system for us meant expanding social insurance systems and social assistance programs both in kind and in cash to low low income communities but also the most vulnerable groups secondly we are talking about you know making sure that every resource that goes into building the economy should be tied to incentives with industries to make sure that they promote green jobs any cash for work that is being given for informal workers or employment or people that are not employed should go into ecosystem restoration so that they invest in upgrading public spaces that was the idea and when we talk about resilient systems we also talk about bridging the digital divide or rather enhancing the digital infrastructure that's the way we would build resilience and in accessing in accelerating climate change in particular in um, in south africa we were talking about how energy systems can be made much more stronger so this is an example of south africa i'm looking at um, the example of uh, eswatini when we talk about eswatini the the number of people who were under social protection mechanisms and social protection systems was extremely low and this is the first time in the pandemic a push on making sure people are capable to look after themselves not only this crisis but that is expanded for a longer term and then in terms of looking at nature based solutions they had a pillar on nature based solutions the two important elements that i want to highlight today is improved techniques for water harvesting at the community level introducing community gardens to provide more food install solar power submissible submissible hand pumps in communities and then in terms of uh, accelerating climate change it was about accelerating any renewable energy programs that was planned in the government so we did an energy sector assessment but the energy sector assessment not only focused on how uh, employees were trained to make sure that they uh, maintain energy systems but also switch to or transition accelerate any transition to renewable energy that was what was being incentivized uh, through the recovery strategy and this the plan was already existing within the government all they needed to is to accelerate it uh, we are also doing a covid-19 recovery framework along with the african union commission it is a continent wide recovery framework and in the continent wide recovery framework we are still in the stage of developing a recovery strategy how were the minister the african union had their own rica green recovery action plan and in the green recovery action plan they were extremely clear they want a clean recovery and a resilient recovery that was the ambition of the african union commission and so their objective to have a clean and resilient recovery meant that they will focus on enhancing ict and improving water management they would increase support to renewable energy and energy efficiency and also when they say just transition programs it just means more support to the most vulnerable which included informal workers but also people with disabilities uh, people living with hiv aids particularly in africa that is a large group of people asylum and refugee seekers for some sort of to be covered under emergency cash transfers or any sort of social assistance program be it in kind if it is not in cash as well and then focus on nature based solution and biodiversity so sustainable land management forestry and ecotourism and in all the countries that we have done so far whether it is zambia south africa or swaziland we notice or iswatini as it is mentioned now tourism is a big part of the economy 
how about transition from a tourism from a regular tourism that is based on international economy and transition to a local tourism and ecotourism are two elements that were highlighted in all the three assessments that we have done and it is also in the africa recovery framework and of course resilient ag agriculture and green jobs uh, my final uh, two slides are about the ambition that we are seeking we are seeking that these three pillars that we have pushed in all the covid-19 recovery needs assessment should actually be much more stronger through investment in public works every investment in public works that the government is making as a part of the pandemic through the fiscal stimulus packages should be about ecosystem restoration whether it is uh, whether it is ponds whether it is riverside whether it is river um, uh, whether it is bridges or whether it is community infrastructure it should be all about ecosystem restoration and in in many countries in africa it is about growth of forest regrowth regrowth of forest as well sustainable agriculture and i have also mentioned about creating more green spaces resilient systems because the countries were looking at the economy resilient systems stood very strong and the common thread among all the assessments in all countries and this is what we are hoping and we push for is digital infrastructure and systems for business continuity and it's become a, a standard that in all countries especially where income has to be employment has to be come back into the economy has to come back again to play digital infrastructure and business continuity is extremely important and of course we are talking about green infrastructure which is about investing in large uh, scale you know in health infrastructure that was the only opportunity we saw in infrastructure uh, in in the pandemic which is about making sure that our infrastructure is green it is uh, powered by solar water systems are natural and uh, waste management is very well managed in the hospitals those were the three or four uh, benchmarks that we put together for hospital uh, so that health services become much more improved and more resilient but also green and then there was a big big push for looking at drr systems national disaster management systems in every country have played a significant role in management of this crisis however their role was at times very limited in certain contexts because their role was understood to be in terms of a natural hazard only whereas the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction talk clearly talks about inclusion of biological hazard as well ndmas and ministry of health have to work together with ndmas with their capacity for early warning their capacity for community preparedness their capacity for communication communication with communities has to be maximized for uh covid-19 uh, management or any pandemic management and of course accelerating climate change goals this is the opportunity when climate change should be brought into fore you know with the with uh, with the eu having special plans about investing in green economy and um, ensuring the part of the fiscal stimulus budget is going towards climate change goals incentivizing and in uh, giving incentives to industries and standards to industries to ensure low, low carbon green jobs uh, incentivizing industries to invest in renewables and then protection of the most vulnerable people those are the key highlights that you would like to see in accelerating climate change so this this is the clear ambition we are pushing for we hope that governments will continue to invest in these three areas that we have pushed however there are significant challenges and lessons as you would imagine uh I, when we start the assessment there is sometimes the inability to see the interconnectedness of the risks you know that there and also to understand that investing in green solutions will have a multiplier effect that ability to be able to see it to make make them go beyond their immediate sector into uh, looking at the big picture that is a challenge in several countries plus as you would imagine with little resources there is competing priorities so everyone is looking for what they can address immediately how things can be managed at the moment that means we just address the health crisis make sure curse loads go down let's think about the other things later that's the that's the um, that's the dilemma with every country that we go to uh, the low capacity to facilitate transition from an uh, from a fuel based economy to a fully uh, green economy 
the problem here is suppose we talk about tourism sector as well there is going to be a lot of money going into making sure tourism comes back fully but here we are talking about not tourism coming back in the way it was before but tourism coming back in a way that is more sustainable that is locally uh, dependent that is not so much it, that does not be, depend on international uh, flying in all the time you know that transition a plan for the transition that transition plan has to be made sector by sector for each ministry and that is a capacity that is clearly missing and that's some so something that we are hoping that we will support and of course limited or no financial uh, allocation towards greening this has been our experience in most of the countries there is very well limited resources particularly because we work in several low income countries and uh, the little resources they have will go to address the emergency rather than looking at the long term so this is our experience that we have had in the last one and a half years i would believe in doing 10 assessments uh, in uh, in the context of the pandemic and uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me miss miss hall thank you so much for your excellent presentation and for sharing this critical methodology for a needs assessment recovery planning building back better um at a time when recovery planning is front of mind and a core issue for virtually every country and community in the context of this pandemic um and thank you for sharing how this methodology has translated into real recovery programming around the world and we're looking forward to hearing more about that from um Azerbaijan later in the session and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Theodoros Zakariadis He is a tenured associate professor at the Energy, Environment, and Water Research Center of the Cyprus Institute. From 2009 to 2020, he served as an assistant and then associate professor of environmental economics and energy resource management at the Cyprus University of Technology. 2015 to 2020, he was the dean of the university's Faculty of Geotechnical Sciences and Environmental Management. He is a member of the scientific committee of the European Environment Agency. and the managing team of the European branch of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Mr. Zakariadis, please you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me to your uh, exciting event. Um I'm I'm honored and delighted to to take part. Uh, I will uh, provide a, a brief overview of a study that uh, we finished a few months ago. uh together with academics from the United Kingdom and uh, economists from the World Bank on providing um, a science policy framework as we called it to design uh economic recovery measures that are familiar to policy makers realistic to implement and aligned with the United Nations sustainable development goals um when the pandemic started and the lockdown started and uh, uh economic activity virtually stopped uh there were already in spring 2020 um calls mainly from international organizations for the need uh for economic stimulus after the pandemic that would not be a business as usual stimulus but it would support the decarbonization objectives and more broadly sustainable development objectives um of course these calls are generic they are very useful they are inevitably generic if they are uh, provided by an international organization but then in order to be implemented in a country or a regional context there is a lot of groundwork to be done uh, for that specific national context because each country has its particularities would need different interventions because different measures provide different added value in different countries uh but in any case uh we are talking about measures that would be green would either promote energy efficiency or sustainable mobility the circular economy nature based solutions and so on and uh of course being in the european union uh and uh, working in cyprus which is an eu member state uh we also called for working within the eu context which uh Uh, has provided an unprecedented uh, uh funding uh, platform uh, through this next generation eu program all this was already discussed and agreed at some point in 2020 so all the recovery measures were uh, considered in this context we started in spring 2020 in cyprus 
um, outlining the need for green post-pandemic recovery measures and um, uh, providing policy briefs, discussing with policymakers, adding to the uh, experience that uh, uh, to, to the measures that the finance ministry was announcing uh, for supporting um, economic recovery at the early stages in summer 2020. But at the same time, through the, our network of collaborators in the, in the UK and the World Bank, we, we generalized our approach in order not to have it too country specific, but to provide a broader framework that we call science policy framework. And in this uh, context, um, we could say that we moved in seven steps um, from uh, spring 2020 until spring 2021, essentially. Uh, these are listed here. I will not go through them in detail. Uh, you, you can find the link where you can uh, find more information about this. Essentially, it was about starting with screening and making a first rough assessment of potential green stimulus measures, then discussing them with national policymakers, then putting them in the broader framework, then doing some modeling and some stakeholder consultation work, and ending with prioritizing different measures. Um, we examined a number of uh, economic stimulus measures that would uh, promote at least some of the sustainability objectives. Uh, and we assessed each one of these measures with uh, a list of criteria, which we took from a broader sustainability checklist that the World Bank had published in early 2020. Um, this table shows uh, in, a, in a summary view, the, the criteria that we used to assess each one of the measures. On the left uh, hand, uh, on the left column, you have short-term criteria, criteria by which uh, the performance of measures could be assessed for the two years, we could say, uh, after the first crisis, so 2021 and 22. And uh, in the long, uh, the long in the in the right column, we have longer term criteria up to 2030 or 2050 even. And in the upper part of the table, we have energy and environmental criteria before, uh, by which we could judge the performance of recovery measures. And in the bottom part, we have economic or also social political criteria that had to do with affordability or social acceptance of the measures, but also things like uh, the possibility to enhance economic growth or to create jobs in the short and in the long run, um, uh, respectively. Um, and to, do, to apply this methodology and to assess the, uh, the different recovery measures with this long list of criteria, we combined different methods and models. We used an open source energy model, the Osmosis platform, if you have heard about it, uh, which we have already used uh, in the past for um, making long-term energy planning and uh, strategies for the Republic of Cyprus. So we used this in order to assess the energy savings and the emissions impact of each one of the measures. We used also an open source economic input output model that we had developed in the past, again, for the country to assess the effect of each measure on economic output and on employment by sector, by sector of the economy. Uh, and we complemented this with multi-criteria decision assessment methods. You can see here uh, two different methods that we used um, because there are also qualitative uh, criteria uh, for uh, assessing the measures, because not all measures could be uh, simulated with models. So the multi-criteria method involved providing a score by criterion and by measure and a weight uh, for each criterion. And who provided this input? It was not us. Uh, it was um, uh, diverse societal stakeholders. We organized the uh, an in-person workshop in October 2020 uh, with 10 stakeholders from different governmental departments, from business associations and from NGOs, um, because the multi-criteria method was quite detailed and we prepare, preferred to have an in-person workshop, despite the limitations of the pandemic that forced us 
not to have many, many more participants. So we restricted this participation to 10 stakeholders, but it was important for us to have the in-person the in -person meeting because we wanted to uh, provide sufficient documentation and information about each recovery measure and each sustainability criterion so that the input that the stakeholders would provide would be meaningful. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the results that were not, the, this is part, not part of the multi-criteria assessment method uh, that uh, used input from stakeholders. It is part of our modeling work. You can see with the blue dots, different green recovery measures. Not all of them are explained uh, what they are about. And we have plotted these um, to show their economic effectiveness, you could say, in terms of uh, how much economic output each measure generates per million of euro invested on the horizontal axis uh, versus the environmental effectiveness on the vertical axis, which was expressed in this case because we had different environmental indicators in terms of CO2 emission reductions per million euro invested in each project. And um, you can see that uh, there is no, uh, of course, there's no clear uh, picture because it very much depends on the measures, but some measures that are, uh, per, is, are performing well yeah, in terms of growth enhancement may not be environmentally improving and vice versa. But there are cases, of course, where a measure may be good for economic growth or for jobs and could also be uh, uh, beneficial to the environment. What is use, uh, useful to see here and is interesting is the, uh, the red dot um, in the middle of the graph, um, which has zero emission savings and has a modest economic performance. Uh, the one uh, which we have uh, declared as uniform demand stimulus. That was a simulation we did, um, assuming that no green measure is adopted for the recovery uh, period, but uh, the government would provide any economic stimulus to the current economic activities as they are. So they would provide something like helicopter money to boost demand, or they could um, uh, they could uh, support businesses exactly as a, uh, uh, exactly the way they are operating now, as a, depending on the the fraction of total economic activity done by different businesses. And you can see that, of course, this does not provide any environmental improvement compared to business as usual, but also economically it's modest. And there are green measures, some of them, some of the bl blue dots that not only perform better environmentally, that's clear, but they also perform better economically. Uh, you can take a look at the study for more results. Our main conclusions were that, um, first of all, the one that I've just mentioned to you, that the, an untargeted economy-wide stimulus is not only environmentally not preferable and unsustainable, but in, is also economically inferior because we have seen that several green measures can create up to twice as many jobs than a status quo recovery. Um, this is not very obvious from different studies because there have been many studies of green measures that show that if you put more money, of course, in you know energy efficiency or renewable energy projects or nature-based solutions, you create more jobs. Okay, but of course you you reduce spending for some other sectors of the economy. So what could be the net effect? Um, so we are showing here uh, that um, the the status quo spending is also economically not the preferable one. There has been a, a very recent study published by the World Resources Institute, uh, uh, the Green Jobs Advantage, uh, which shows something very similar. Now, another finding of our study is that, of course, not all green measures are beneficial for both the economy and the environment, and that it is also important to consider the, the time horizon. Some measures that may be promising in the short term may not be uh, useful for a long-term sustainable economic development. Uh, so there are trade-offs between short-term effects, medium-term, and uh, very longer-term effects, for example, to serve the climate neutrality target. We have also found out that some institutional changes 
which could also be considered as green recovery measures, may have low costs, may not have an impressive performance in the short term, but they may be very important to ensure long-term sustainability, such as a green tax reform or um, a modernization of the institutional uh, setting so that decentralized renewable energy generation can take place over the years. Uh, in, it is important, however, for this analysis to make it realistic to combine simple methods and more sophisticated models and input from policymakers. So for this, uh, per, uh, for this to be done, we need as much as possible open source models that could be accessible to everyone, transparent methods and participation of stakeholders during the design of the stimulus measures. Because uh, the more stakeholders are involved from the very start, the more likely it becomes for these measures to be implemented actually. And you need a combination of uh, expertise in policy making, expertise in businesses and expertise from civil society organizations to provide input because each one has different views but they can um, provide their own experience in the design of the different measures. Um, so we can not only de uh, depend on models even if they are open source and they can be checked by anyone. Uh, but we cannot only, only depend on the, the input from a specific group of stakeholders, but we need a broader participation. Now, uh, this uh, work that we did um, was used by the government of Cyprus in the uh, preparation of the European Union recovery plan, the national recovery plan of Cyprus, that was in the frame that was prepared in the frame of the broader EU recovery initiatives that were funded also are being funded right now uh, from the so-called recovery and resilience facility. For this, um, we also try to link the recovery measures with specific sustainable development goals. The list of sustainability criteria that I showed you some slides before. Uh, also have a linkage to specific SDGs that each criterion serves. But what we have done additionally, in addition to the previous uh, uh, study that uh, I talked to you about, uh, was to conduct first, first for Cyprus, an assessment of every single recovery measure that was included in the National Recovery and Resilience Plan against its performance to improve different, uh, for improving different SDGs. Currently, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network Europe, in which I'm a member of the managing team, is including such an assessment for the recovery plans of Spain and Italy. And this will be published in the annual Europe Sustainable Development Report. The one of 2021 will be published by, towards the end of the year, I think in December. So they are using this approach. And we are doing further assessments um, and tools to be included in a different report of SDSN Europe, a so-called report of the SDSN European Green Deal Senior Working Group, and I can provide you with more information about it. Uh, what was the result of this? Um, this is um, a graph showing um, the different SDGs uh, in the recovery plan of Cyprus. And as I told you, this is now being done further for Spain and Italy. Um, and how much, how much importance uh, each SDG has gained in the national recovery plan based on the number of individual measures that address one or more SDGs. Um, and you can see that SDG 9 that has to do with infrastructure and digitalization uh, has been an important part of the recovery plan. Um, SDG 13 that had to do with climate action seems to be an important part, but does not seem to have a very strong uh, focus right now uh, if you observe the number of individual measures. And SDG 16 that has to do with justice um, and um, um, uh, institutional reforms has been important. But that's one way to read a recovery package uh, compared to SDGs by the number of individual measures. You can also observe a recovery package on the basis of the budget allocated to each measure. And there you can, see, you can see that SDG 13 on climate action has gained much importance because there may be a limited number of measures, but having a huge budget 
for you know electrification of transport energy efficiency in buildings providing and um, promoting renewable energy and the like whereas sdg 16 because it involves institutional reforms has a relatively short fraction of the budget but this doesn't mean that sdg 16 is not important because uh, it is these are low cost measures uh, as has been shown in the previous slide if you count the number of interventions that have been included and are relevant for SDG 16, then this is an important uh, part too. Um, we have more information on this on a specific report linking recovery plans with SDGs that I'm providing the, uh, the link here. And I have provided you also on this slide with a link to the uh, World Bank report, um, the working paper of our joint work uh, with the World Bank and the UK academics and also a summary of this uh, recovery uh, project on World Bank's climate block. I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zakariadis, for sharing what is really a very important and practical model and program uh, to provide decision support for recovery planning and, and for providing so much clarity on, on the benefits of green measures in both the short and long term for uh, sustainability, decarbonization, and, uh, and the economy. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Charu Bist, who uh, will present the case of Azerbaijan. Ms. Bist is the resident representative in Azerbaijan for UNDP. She has contributed to UNDP's response in over 20 countries and has over 19 years of professional experience, including assignments in New York, Lesotho, Ethiopia, and Nepal. She brings global experience on SDG integration, digital technology, youth employment, acceleration and innovation, private sector partnerships such as the Climate Smart Accelerator, the Green Climate Fund and building artificial intelligence uh, and satellite imagery into traditional resilience and development programs. She provides strategic policy advice tailored to country specific needs built on global program ex experience. Her credentials are quite extensive, including disaster needs assessments. And while uh, unfortunately the delegate from the government of Azerbaijan was unable to join the session, we are Truly honored to have Ms. Bist, who led the coronavirus recovery needs assessment process in Azerbaijan. Ms. Bist, please go ahead and share your screen and unmute your microphone, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, dear colleagues, dear participants, distinguished uh, panel speakers. My name is uh, Charu Bist, and I'm the resident representative AI right now in Azerbaijan. And I thank, for, thank you for the opportunity to present at the forum and to share UNDP country offices uh, actions and visions in moving forward on green recovery. To assist the government to meet its climate action goals, UNDP country office in Azerbaijan prioritizes the country's shift to a greener economy that is resilient to climate risks, energy efficient and sustainably manages natural resources. A vision for green growth is definitely required to help mitigate environmental risks, to reduce the vulnerability of the population, particularly in rural areas, and to help build resilience to natural disasters. These have all been a priority while UNDP Azerbaijan and the UN country team with the government of Azerbaijan conducted the socioeconomic assessment on COVID-19 together with UN agencies and relevant government counterparts under the technical leadership of UNDP, both from New York and uh, from the regional office and within the country office itself here. As a result, there have been many follow-ups uh, that the government itself has led, particularly focusing on vulnerable population, the, on social assistance, and a support, immediate support to the micro and small medium enterprises. In total, to address the negative economic consequences of the pandemic, the government of Azerbaijan had allocated US dollar 1.9 billion from the state budget with key recommendations from the, from the CRNA process taken into consideration. As a follow-up, UNDP office in Azerbaijan, together with the government, also followed up the CRNA with a number of immediate assessments aiming to explore the impact of the suggested support packages on micro, small, and medium enterprises. And based on the gaps, new design, new interventions were designed to support the MSMEs. The CRNA in Azerbaijan had a strong focus on a green recovery and also explored mid-term and long-term measures to achieve it. 
A focus on green jobs, green livelihoods, and green recovery can together help to accelerate a transition towards green prosperity, towards a green economy that sustains people, the planet, and prosperity. The assessment has explored areas that could accelerate the shifts. Those are in energy efficiency and the creation of green jobs through expanding public works. The largest potential for the creation of new jobs comes from retrofitting buildings to improve energy efficiency in the electricity sector, particularly in grids and renewables, as well as through energy efficiency in industries, including food, and low carbon transport opportunities. At the same time, we, have, we are exploring more pathways that can create green jobs that have been suggested in the assessment. Those are through the expansion of public work programs such as ecosystem restoration and tree planting and transitioning into sustainable agriculture and agroforestry. The suggested economic packages will speed up Azerbaijan's transition to a green economy but we all know that partnerships, private sector interests, and a lot of uh, partnerships are still required for all of us to move towards these pathways, which have been consistently explored. The CRNA has been conducted in August 2020, and in February 2021, the president of Azerbaijan has signed an order on Azerbaijan 2030 National Priorities for Socioeconomic Development which emphasizes five national development priorities, one of which is a clean environment and a country of green growth. The government of Azerbaijan elaborates the priority as it is necessary to ensure the amelioration of the environment, the rapid restoration and expansion of green spaces, and the efficient usage of water resources and sustainable energy sources along with economic development. We looked into the specific broad policy recommendations, such as in the power sector, focusing on enhancing the generation and use of renewable energy, strengthening its climate change adaptation priorities as part of the climate change response and upgrading of the national determined contributions, especially focusing on agriculture and forestry sectors. We also are looking into promoting private sector investment in sustainable agriculture and agroforestry, providing small grants to MSMEs, uh, micro and small medium enterprises to develop new value added products and supply chains. And we are also looking together on developing publicly funded incentives and reform subsidies to catalyze sustainable agriculture and agroforestry by adjusting a range of subsidies and incentives the government could reduce both the use of these inputs while promoting a transition to a sustainable regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. Um, direct public works for reforestation, hiring people directly in each of the various stages of re reforestation is a viable pathway for if Azerbaijan plans on including direct public works in its COVID-19 recovery plan. Uh, private sector investment to undertake forest rest restoration. This can be achieved through four steps to access private sector finance for forest restoration, namely identifying relevant investors, developing a business plan, setting up an investable entity and tracking performance. Payments for ecosystems too are already being widely used around the world. Um, we have been exploring that in Azerbaijan within a UNDP supported project and it is one of the core recommendations of a study in forests in Azerbaijan that is currently being finalized. As UNDP, we are with the government and providing necessary support and technical guidance to implement these and other measures to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and also address climate change while moving towards green transitions. Protecting the environment and addressing climate change is one of the key outcomes of the UNDP, of UNDP country office uh, strategic plan. Using the momentum, UNDP supports the government to improve access to green finance, national adaptation planning, improve agrobiodiversity protection, and energy efficiency. Together with the government partners, UNDP works on conservation and sustainable use of locally important agrobiodiversity through improving agricultural productivity and reducing land degradation using native crops and improving access to commercial markets for agricultural products derived from the targeted native crop species. 
to accelerate the achievements towards the SDGs, UNDP and Azerbaijan consider supporting a planning process of financing sustainable development, which we hope will be aligned with the green growth principles. Since the presentation of its nat national determined contributions in 2015, the government of Azerbaijan has embarked on the preparation and implementation of a national adaptation plan. We support uh, the government to facilitate the development of the NAP and improve climate change adaptation of actions in Azerbaijan in three priority sectors, water, agriculture, and coastal areas. We are in the latest, latest stages of preparation for the project document on scaling up investment in energy efficiency in buildings through the enhanced energy management information system and green social housing which has a strong component in creating green jobs in the energy sector. We firmly believe in green recovery and mobilizing resources, partnerships to support the government in paving the way towards greener transitions. We also believe that putting people and planet first will lead to a sustainable future for all. I would like to conclude my presentation here and I'm ready for the next session on questions and panel discussion. Thank you to all. Thank you so much, Ms. Fist, and thank you for uh, sharing with us um, all of the wide-ranging efforts that Azerbaijan is making toward uh, building back better and to greening recovery and to building resilience and recovery. Um, and we're looking forward to discussing this with you further in the discussion part of our session. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Mr. Valeri Bezos. Uh, Mr. Bezos is the head of uh, the State Agency on Energy Efficiency and Energy Saving for the Government of Ukraine. Uh, he has expertise in economics, law, and public administration. He has significant experience in cooperation with international financial institutions and organizations, as well as many years of experience in the economy sector of Ukraine. In 2016 to 2019, he held the position of Deputy Head of the Regional Council for the Executive Office. Uh, he was active in public and expert activities as the Vice President of the Energy Club and President of the Ukraine Association of Drinking Water and the President of ARDI, which is an NGO, um, uh, the Agency of Regional Development and Investment, and uh, the Deputy Head of the Public Council for National Electricity Regulation Commission, as well as the Deputy Head of the Public Council at the Ministry of Energy at, in Ukraine. Uh, in 2021, uh, he was appointed as the head of the State Agency on Energy Efficiency and Energy Saving of Ukraine. We are honored and delighted to have you here, Mr. Bezos. Please go ahead and uh, unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a great honor to, uh, for me to participate in such a significant event and uh, discussing the issues of post-crisis assessment and green recovery planning, which are extremely necessary and timely worldwide. To begin with, I would like to emphasize that Ukraine has a significant energy efficiency potential, uh, unrealized potential in all, so all sectors, or sec sectors of the economy. And we are going to use it as one of the key points of our efforts. We have a clear vision of uh, quality strategic management in the field of energy efficiency, which provides not only political, organizational and legal components, but financial as well. Uh, and in this context, uh, there are great opportunities for international cooperation. Uh, the main goal is to create conditions for for a comprehensive and systematic energy efficiency increase in Ukraine's economy. I emphasize comprehensively and systematically without any fragmentation. It's a universal tool that is being fully used by all the world's leading countries to prevent energy poverty and reduce energy dependence. It's also one of the ways of decarbonization. This is stated in the European Green Agreement, uh, the Paris Agreement, and the recent UN Conference on Climate Change, COP26. Uh, Ukraine formulates and implements policies in accordance with uh, realities, domestic needs, and international obligations, including the association agreement with the EU, the Energy Commun uh, Community Treaty, the Paris Agreement, and the New European Green Deal. Ukraine is also 
uh, Ukraine also continues to take measures to strengthen the regu regulatory framework and to introduce practical tools for implementing energy efficiency policy. Uh, on July 30 this year, the government approved uh, the updated nationally determined contribution of Ukraine to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the document sets a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 35% by 2030, uh, compared to uh, 1990. Among the main steps, steps to achieve uh, this indicator is uh, the next, uh, in the next uh, 10 years are several measures aimed at proving the energy efficiency of the national common, uh, economy. Uh, including for sure modernization of, of energy and industrial companies, uh, energy efficiency measures uh, in all sectors of the common, uh, economy, uh, starting from production silks, transportation to consumption, renovation wave for buildings, including uh, households and public buildings as well. In October 21, uh, the Parliament uh, of Ukraine adopted the law, the law, the key law on energy efficiency to implement uh, the European uh, Directive. Uh, the main purpose of the law is to stimulate uh, energy efficiency in all sectors of the economy at all uh, stage, as I have mentioned. Um, currently, we started the uh, structuring of, for the, of our further work on the development and adoption of necessary bylaws. Uh, uh, a, draw, a draft uh, national energy efficiency action plan uh, 2030 also has been developed and submitted to the government and recently, uh, recently under uh, the uh, under their, uh, uh, implementation phase. The purpose of the draft uh, act is to define the national energy efficiency target and horizontal and sectoral measures to achieve it, following the European approaches on Directive 27 on energy efficiency. Among the policy tools, we is, uh, there is significant potential for uh, launching targeted, so-called targeted support programs. Such programs are the catalyst uh, that lower barriers, uh, launch a series of projects, uh, reaching the, uh, the national scale and the local needs. Uh, in particular, state and local budgets for energy efficiency are needed uh, as drivers to, of change in this area, including unlocking projects supported by uh, international financial institutions. It's also important for achieving uh, the potential of private investment, which in turn will have a multiplier effect on Ukraine's economy. Among the main instruments for, uh, of Ukraine state policy in the field of energy efficiency is, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, the so-called uh, state uh, targeted programs. Uh, at the initiative of the energy, uh, of the uh, energy efficiency energy agency, there was prepared a draft decision of the government on the continuation and expansion of the state targeted economic program for energy efficiency for 2022-2027. Uh, the program is aimed uh, at implementing effective tool, tools to promote energy efficiency in private households, heat, uh, district heating, water supply and sewerage. Uh, the program will contribute to the achievement of the goals and objectives of the energy strategy uh, of Ukraine 2035. Uh, the sustainable development goals of UK in 2030, as well as the long-term priorities of the government. Uh, the agency ensures of uh, functioning of the field of energy certifications for buildings, which allows uh, understanding the condition on bu of uh, uh, buildings, uh, uh, buildings energy efficiency under construction and already built ones to provide appropriate steps to improve energy efficiency, including a gradual increase in minimum energy efficiency requirements for buildings, uh, following uh, the exact classes of energy efficiency. Uh, the state agency supports the development of energy efficient construction activity as well. We all know that the uh, energy dependent house is a significant contribution 
to the energy, energy independence, and the independence of the state, decarbonization of the environment, and uh, the creation of comfortable living conditions for citizens. For citizens. A agency is working to create a database of energy and operational characteristic of central executive bodies building for its further launch into trial operation. At the same state, together with the Ministry of Communities and Territories, uh, uh, Development of Ukraine and the Ministry uh, of Energy, the agency participates in the development of a draft resolution of the cabinet ministers on implementation of energy management system and amendments to some res uh, resolution of the cabinet of Minister of Ukraine, which will improve the obligatory energy management system implementation in state and executive authorities and, uh, and local governments and municipalities. Ukraine is implementing an, an energy labeling system and uh, setting requirements for the eco-design of energy products in accordance with the updated EU legislation. In this context, uh, the state agency develops technical regulations on eco-design and energy labeling. One of the tools which is being implemented by the state agency is so-called green bonds. Uh, at the, at the, our initiative, uh, the legal framework for the insurance of issuance of the green bonds and rules for participants in such a market have been developed and already established. Uh, the basic law came into force on July 1 uh, this year. Uh, the, uh, this means that co uh, corporate issuers already have the right to issue green bonds and uh, they, uh, they have been using this instrument already. We are already studying the possibility of implementing the first pilot projects for the issuance of green bonds by various uh, categories of issuers, especially municipalities. And we are working on the creation of green technical office on the basis of the state agency. This office uh, should accelerate the implementation of green projects in all sectors of the economy and attract green fundings with uh, key priorities on uh, the municipalities level. Um, uh, IFC estimates that by uh, 2030 Ukraine will be able to attract more than uh, 70 billion euros uh, of investments uh, in, uh, to this channel and we are going to use this assessment as our key key target. Uh, uh, I'm convinced that uh, green funding is one of the promising areas for cooperation with uh, international partners. Uh, Ukraine has also set clear goals for the development of renewable energy. Uh, we are going to achieve 25% of green energy in the primary energy supply uh, by 2035. It's stated, it is stated in our energy strategy. This area has um, uh, opportunities for the implementation of investment projects. For example, since uh, 20 uh, Oh, 09 till the third quarter of 2021, 20, uh, Ukraine introduced uh, up to 10 gigawatts of capacity that generates electricity from renewable sources. Uh, in addition, during the per period uh, from 2014 to September this year, uh, 2.5 gigawatts of new bare mass capacity in the heat sector was put into uh, operations. This is an investment for about uh, uh, 550 million euros. At the same time, there is a significant potential for further development of uh, this area, especially in the um, sector that I have mentioned, bioenergy. Ukraine is an agrarian country, so bioenergy can become one of the strategic directions on the way of natural gas, gas uh, substitution uh, reducing the level of import dependence and strengthening uh, the economy of our state. Uh, to develop bioenergy, uh, several bills have been developed, in particular on the development uh, of the liquid uh, biofuel markets, on the development of the solid biofuel markets, on the ex uh, exemption of biofuels from the CO2 tax, on stimulation of the energy corpse cultivation. 
Uh, and in addition, uh, this November, the law of Ukraine on the biomethane market development came into force, uh, which established a procedure for providing a guarantee of biomethane origin. Adoption of this law will allow launching the biomethane bi market, uh, markets in Ukraine and establishing biomethane exports to the EU, uh, which is a great field of opportunities. A national uh, renewable energy plan 2030 is already currently being developed, which will set uh, national indi indicative tar targets for the development of renewable energy until 2030. As part uh, of the implementation of the provisions of 28th directive, EU directive, on the promotion of the use of energy from renewables, Ukraine has accepted an obligation to uh, introduce guarantees of origin of electricity. Uh, the introduction of um, uh, guarantees of origin in Ukraine is extremely important before the inter introduction in the EU of a carbon tax and carbon border adjustment mechanism for selective sectors. Then, uh, thanks to guarantees of origin, Ukrainian exporters will be able to buy green electricity and uh, confirm its use during the production and export of their products. Ukraine sees great advantages of the production uh, and use of hydrogen uh, and uh, as a key element of the newborn, uh, new brave uh, hydrogen economy. Uh, because this area will, will allow us to reduce the use of uh, traditional fuels in the national economy and consequently decarbonize it. Solve the existing problems in the country's energy in, in terms of ensuring stable and reliable cooperation uh, in, of, in Ukraine. Uh, allow Ukraine to become an exporter of hydrogen to EU countries, which will contribute to the additional incomes to the national budget as well. Uh, Following, uh, following the goal of uh, energy strategy of Ukraine until 2035 to increase the use of renewable sources, the average annual production of green hydrogen may reach 5.5 uh, billion um, cubic meters. The European Un Union has already approved the hydrogen strategy for climate na natural Europe in which Ukraine has been ident identified as a priority partner for cooperation in the production and use of uh, green hydrogen. The mentioned strategy envisage, uh, among other things, uh, financing the production of green hydrogen by partner countries, countries and its supply to the EU. In Ukraine, it's pre-planned to install up to 10 gigawatts of such capacity. We are also actively working on the development of the draft strategy for the development of hydrogen energy of Ukraine uh, 2050. In general, I assure that energy efficiency and renewable energy in Ukraine open a wide horizon for, horizon for a sectoral and cross-sectoral work, as well as beneficial international cooperation and the involvement of the best practices of EU countries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bezos, and for sharing with us um, a truly robust agenda for uh, energy efficiency and um, and for uh, green recovery in, in Ukraine. Um, and I, I'd like to go ahead and transition us to our uh, to the discussion part of our session today. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their excellent presentations and uh, to invite um, our panelists to join us for the final discussion. Uh, for our discussion today, um, I would like to introduce our distinguished discussants. Um, first, I will reintroduce Mr. Ronald Jackson, who uh, is, gave our opening remarks, and he is the uh, head of disaster risk reduction and recovery for building resilience team at UNDP, and he is currently the IRP steering committee chair. And we are very pleased to also welcome Ms. Paula Albrito. She is the chief of branch for intergovernmental processes, interagency cooperation and partnerships with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, so for our discussion today, I'd like to start off with um, uh, a question about how we can 
uh, broaden our view from the uh, the lessons that we've learned from from these experiences to uh, disaster recovery um, uh, in general. And so maybe, maybe I can direct it first uh, to Mr. Jackson. Um, what do we think that we can learn about disaster recovery from our Gener in general from our presenters today, not just from the COVID-19 pandemic, but what lessons do we think we can glean for disaster recovery um, practice and planning in general? Thanks, thanks, um, thanks Paul. I think there are three, th three key things that came out to me um, in listening to our speakers. One, that the all crisis provides an opportunity to, to really promote sustainable principles in an effort to, to, to sort of resolve, I would say, points of failure or, or bad development you know, decisions that we've taken in the past. Um, and it, it is really demonstrating the fact that we need to, we need to take a, a much more integrated look at the issues, um, looking at also systems um, and looking, you know, interesting enough, we heard government speakers, but also looking at, at, at government's capacity to plan better. A lot of that came out in the presentation around how we look at our, our planning approach. Second one, um, you know, how are we then really engaging people in this process? You know, oftentimes when we, we, we talk about recovery, um, as practitioners, we get very focused on the government leads, the government architecture, the UN system, but how are we connecting people um, in, in that? And then I will add um, the role of science um, and how that can be you know, used as a point um, to connect all of these actors. Uh, and I said three, but I think you know, my, my third point was pretty much captured within, within the two, within, within the two, within the two there. Um, but I think we mustn't, we mustn't forget that this really is a, a window of opportunity. You know, so cry, the crisis provides windows of opportunity. And I think that also came out very strongly in the examples um, that colleagues have presented. I'll stop there and leave the colleagues with a space to speak more. Oh, terrific, thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. Ms. Salbrito, can I uh, direct the same question to you about what lessons do we think that we can glean for disaster recovery in general from what we've learned today? Sure, Paul, with pleasure. And actually, let me say that uh, the reflection, the main reflection of Ronald in terms of uh, uh, building back better in recovery as an opportunity uh, in order to ensure that we create greater resilience and sustainability is, is also the main uh, lesson and message that I heard today from our panelists. Also very important, and I, this is why I welcome uh, this session and the focus of the session. Very happy to hear that greening has been viewed as an opportunity for impacted sector that can pay dividends towards short and long-term economic recovery and resilience. Um, we heard from Azerbaijan, and importantly, this approach also responds to climate change while providing other benefits such as preservation and natural resources. Um, this was also topped in the presentation with further associated financial and budget engagement. I think that greening is one of the less exploited and innovative approach in recovery, particularly when we're looking at infrastructure sector. And I hope that this valuable and forward-looking approach will be used in a more systematic manner by all countries. It's something that needs to be picked up more. Um, I also believe that recovery efforts require an all of societal approach. And, and uh, we heard the different panelists uh, touching upon this, one referring to the issue of silos. And I really believe that we coordinated and complementary action across the sectors and stakeholders group, we can go really behind these silos. And if we don't do this, we are not going to succeed in building a resilient and sustainable recovery. Um, this is also because it is more likely that the emerging recovery measure are going to be accepted and picked up actively by the population. And I think the experience from Cyprus goes to the heart of this message where the inclusion of science, policy and planning representatives is, is actually the, the winning approach. Maybe my last point um, dedicated to the private sector. 
we just heard from the speakers, but also uh, at the COP in Glasgow, if we do not engage with the private sector, we are standing on one leg only. And uh, this is really a lesson that emerged today in the sharing of the experiences and the acute reflection of the representative in the panel um, to see this as, uh, as an opportunity, but also as a focus in particular in the context of the SMEs. The experience from Ukraine in greening SMEs, but also the digitalization and uh, the renewable energy is, is a very timely experience to showcase. And similar focus on SME was also indicated by Azerbaijan. It is definitely smart and winning. Why? Because on one hand, the SMEs are the backbone of our economies contributing globally to 50% of our GDPs and yet bearing around 75% of losses every time a disaster strikes. So these were some elements that emerged for me. Maybe last point, we keep talking about the need to immediately respond and recover and, and the long-term uh, objectives of, of our government, of our society, of our community. I think what we heard today, especially in the way in which the discussion has been embedded in the governance structure, is that the winning vision is the long-term one. So being able to, to flexibly respond to the short needs, but have in mind the long-term future of our society is, are elements that I could see um, coming out during the discussion. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Alperito, and this really a wonderful opportunity for us to have uh, two discussions that are able to pull from across all of the uh, presenters that we've had today. Um, but I'd like to also turn back to Ms. Bist as well, because uh, maybe we can reflect on the um, the experience in Azerbaijan about uh, the kinds of lessons that we might be able to glean for disaster recovery in general. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, my notes. All right, uh, so what we can learn from this COVID-19 and many other disasters that we have all been involved as partners, I think a few key lessons is uh, the need and the importance of a coordinated national system of response. Um, COVID-19 and the effects of it, the long-term, immediate, short-term, but the continuing effects of it definitely has brought that into perspective, a strong nationally coordinated system amongst all governments and also amongst partners. Uh, in terms of our various contributions and our work on green recovery, on resilience building, on building forward better, all countries have to make sure that the work we will do now, continuing now on SDGs, uh, uh, needs to make sure that we have a focus on the resilience of it and on the green transitions. That's very critical for most of our countries and especially for here. Um, the finance to accelerate shifts are definitely needed in all sectors. You can't say only in one, from energy, transport, social, labor, health. Shifts are definitely immediately needed. We have heard that even from the recent COP discussions. And to accelerate these shifts, um, and the acceleration is definitely needed, as my other panelists also mentioned, private sector partnerships, their visions and their alignment towards government priorities is super important. We are working on a lot of that here in Azerbaijan. We have the SDG fund project. We are working on aligning SDG goals towards green transitions. We're doing integrated national financing frameworks with a focus on our SDG targets and making sure that now we look at it with a climate and a green resilience lens. And we also have our partners, Green Climate Fund, uh, Global Environment Facility, the EU for climate projects that are working cohesively together to build up a regional experience, to build up knowledge and sharing uh, and basically essentially ensuring that all parts of the programs of their support is also moving towards green and resilient, climate friendly. But however, as we all know, the shifts have to be accelerated. They have to be done now and not even tomorrow. And for that, we need all our partners on board for it. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Bezos, maybe I can turn to you first for this uh, second question. Um, uh, and 
coming from the perspective of uh, your experience with planning for uh, uh, green recovery and taking forward your energy efficiency uh, and resilience agenda uh, in Ukraine, I'm just wondering if um, you, uh, if there's any lessons that you think uh, can be shared that are relevant for other countries and other regions of the world or uh, uh, countries that may be under uh, greater resource constraints, um, lessons learned from your experience in, in this planning and implementation process that, that you think that might be helpful for uh, countries that are now embarking on a uh, uh, COVID-19 recovery planning process. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that uh, for the purpose of uh, keeping the pace uh, of green transitions and uh, getting uh, to the goals, we need to be uh, quite pragmatic uh, and uh, to support uh, the natural uh, base uh, balance of the needs of uh, our economies. We need to be quite idealistic in the further goals, but quite pragmatic uh, in the process of uh, the implementations. We need to take into account uh, our social, uh, social economical environment. We need to uh, put uh, sound, uh, sound um, quasi goals, sound uh, by steps to achieve such goals. Uh, so, Having this opportunity, and I absolutely share the idea, the general idea of using this crisis and post-crisis uh, recovery as a huge window of opportunities. Uh, uh, we really have uh, the possibility to reconstruct, to modernize, modernize uh, our infrastructure of the um, on the new basis uh, um, technological as well as ideological uh, taking in, into account uh, new uh, green tendencies new green ideology or green transitions new uh, ide uh, new ideology of international corporations but keeping the pace uh, um, we need to be quite pragmatic with the uh, uh, actual steps and uh, the actual balances between our social economical needs and our uh, quite idealistic goals. This way we can uh, prove uh, the feasibility of the follow idea of uh, the green recovery. That's terrific. Thank you so much. And maybe now I can also turn back to our discussions to um, sort of reflect on uh, um, the broader range of experiences that we've heard from today. Um, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Ms. Albrito first. Um, the, uh, you know, the European region's experience in green and recovery has been unique in many ways. We heard Mr. Jackson, I think, mention that uh, the European region is leading the world in green recovery spending. Um, but uh, just so we can sort of uh, provide lessons for the rest of the world, what do you think that we could glean from the European recovery experience uh, for other regions and other countries? And in particular, if there's any lessons you think are there for, um, for lower income countries as well. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Europe and Europe region is very close to me. Besides being a European, I was uh, the director of the Europe office and I had the great opportunity to, to, to better interact, understand and, and have an open dialogue with, uh, with many of, uh, of the countries that were part of the panel today, but also with the EU and the EC. And I think we've heard about the strengthening and, and the guiding that is emerging from this uh, important discussion in Europe. First of all, um, I'm positive and I'm excited from what I heard today. The experiences demonstrate that recovering countries and communities can work within their strength and push really from the economy they have now towards the economy that they want, which is greener, more sustainable and more resilient. And this is also a point that was made very clear by Rita in our intervention. We also heard, and I think Europe is, is reflecting um, upon in a very comprehensive manner, that the right analysis can overcome the many competing developing priorities and existing vulnerability, but also the resources constraint. 
And a sound analysis of the situation can balance this factor and make them to better recover and to ensure the decision are sound. Important to note that the highlighted way forward went straight to the heart of the governance. And uh, many of the speakers spoke about law and legislation. Uh, this is how changes are set in the system and our knowledge as a governmental approach. And the experiences of, from Cyprus goes to the heart of this message, where the inclusion of science, policy, and planning in governmental decision represent the winning approach. Now, we have heard and we know, and Europe has been reflecting and is sort of leading in this discussion um, on the fact that we are and we do have a permanent resource constrained context. If it is so visible in Europe, it is clearly visible all around the globe with even more challenges, uh, issues to be addressed. So what we have seen is that there are greener recovery options that will outperform business as usual in spending priorities for recovery. And build on the reflection on innovation and governance today, it also emerged that recovery efforts need diverse financing arrangements to help sustain long-term recovery. And I think that therefore the passage of uh, the economic reforms is a necessity if we want to succeed. And Europe can lead on this because it does have um, reflections in terms of economic reforms that are very much uh, um, based on, on learning by experience from different countries. And maybe my final message, which I think really is a necessity. Um, I believe that it would be necessary to consider putting in place a system for tagging, tracking and screening the disaster risk reduction investments, a kind of resilience taxonomy. Uh, clear boundaries needs to be drawn for investments in a sus unsustainable activities that could harm disaster resilience and climate adaptation. And for recovery to build back better and greener, we need to include both net zero and net resilience gain approach. This is going to be the winning one. Over to you, Paul. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Ms. Alvarito. And uh, I, I understand that we are um, we are running out of time, but I would like to uh, allow Mr. Jackson to have uh, the last word on this question. If there's anything you wanted to add to your um, earlier remarks about the lessons that we can uh, glean from the unique experience of, of uh, Europe's uh, uh, greening recovery. Thanks. Um, thanks, moderator. And I concur with much of what uh, Paula has said, but I think, you know, one of the things we have to recognize is that beyond, if we, if we look beyond Europe into many of the other parts of the world where, where this is a, a, a clear challenge, we recognize that, you know, many other parts of the world are at different stages in terms of their, their, their governance, evolution of their governance, and, you know, that looks at um, the, the legislative reforms that are required, the, the fiscal reforms. It presents challenges in terms of resource availability for, for providing this diverse financing. And so therefore this whole thought, though important of balancing the needs of today while looking towards the vision of the future is whilst important presents particular challenges for some parts of the world. And so therefore it leads me to, to the importance of Paula's point about the engagement of the private sector. Um, so, you know, what is the means of this type of engagement? How will this engagement occur? What's at stake for them? And so, you know, we need to look at business of today and business of tomorrow and how we incentivize them to, to really drive this particular green transition using their current motives for, for investment and spring, spring business. And, and why is the business of tomorrow? I think we also have to look at the, the new entrepreneurs. Where do we find them and where do we begin to to, to shift their thinking around what business of tomorrow looks like. That's what, you know, that's what I'm, what I'm, what I'm also alluding to. And then how do we incentivize them to make that, that type of step? On the COVID recovery part and trying to bring green approaches, um, you know, we, we should not overlook the role of the stimulus packages in these parts of the world where governments are trying to meet the immediate demand for those who are most left behind. And how can we use those stimulus packages as a means of, of, of 
um, employment towards that type of investment. So it's not just giving people money for the sake of giving them money to, to, to survive, which is important, but how can we at the same time you know, address their, you know, their own dignity of wanting to work and deploying that workforce in some of the green transitions? I'll stop, I'll stop there. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, before we, we uh, transition towards the end of our, our session, uh, uh, please let me uh, hand the mic back to uh, Ms. Elbrito for uh, the final word on this discussion. Actually, Paul, uh, let me take the opportunity and, and the, the very short time that, that I have um, to, to, to continue, to tell you that we need to continue this discussion. And, uh, and what I would like to do is, is really to invite you uh, to join us again, to, to, to build on what we heard today um, during the global platform that is going to be taking place in May 2022 in Bali. Um, the focus of, uh, of uh, the reflection in terms of recovery are going to be targeted during the global platform at the fifth session of the World Recovery Conference, which is going to be taking place on the preparatory stage and that will be co-hosted by UNDP, the World Bank and uh, UNDRR under the banner of the International Recovery Platform. The central theme of the fifth session of the World Recovery Platform is reconstructing a sustainable future building resilience through recovery in a COVID-19 transformed world. It will bring together participants from national and local government, civil society, the private sector, the academia, international organization to provide an opportunity to share experiences on different dimension and recovery. What I really can say is that today we heard the wealth of experience that needs to be communicated that we need to learn and, and, and see how best we can apply. So please um, come uh, either in person or virtually to our global platform in, uh, in Bali. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, uh, as we are approaching the limit of our time today, so I'd like to bring our session to a close. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind our audience today that we are happy to take your questions offline through IRB Secretariat, and we will do our best to respond. The email address again is for this, contact at recoveryplatform.org. I'd like to take this uh, final opportunity to thank our eminent speakers for their time and for sharing their experiences and lessons learned with our audiences today. On behalf of the IRP Secretariat, uh, I also like to thank the organizers of the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction for this opportunity to host the IRP featured events during the forum. This has been an extremely useful session and then it will also help to inform IRP's work next year, which means in January in 2022, IRP will host its annual forum called International Recovery Forum in January. So we will also be building towards the seventh global platform for disaster risk reduction and the fifth world reconstruction conference in May 2022, as uh, Paula, Ms. Uh, uh, Paula Arborito has kindly mentioned. So having uh, said this, now I'd like to conclude the session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much all the participants, audience, eminent speakers. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>